Recording. All right. Good morning. This is William Barnard. I'm at First Baptist Church. Actually, I'm at home, but this will be the lesson for February the 21st, uh, Sunday morning. It's lesson number 12 in our quarterly, and I'm glad you guys are all here this morning. The title of the lesson is uh, The Unforgiven. And that always is kind of scary to me when we look at the Bible and we see say something that says the unforgiven. So what I normally do this morning uh, in each Sunday school class is I ask for prayer requests. So I would like for you to just take a moment and think about all of those folks in your lives that need your attention and need your prayer request. And if that individual is you, you please reach out to some of us or to me and let us know that we need to be praying for you because we are intentional about our prayers and we like to make sure that we pray for those that, that need our prayers. Uh, so this morning I'm gonna open with a word of prayer and then I will um, begin um, by uh, uh, in, into our lesson. Let's pray together. Our gracious heavenly father, thank you for allowing us to be together once again, even though we're separated. We ask that you be with us as we are trying to get through this different kind of a year that we've had. And we know that you're in the middle of it and that you are watching over us. And we just ask for your special care for all of those that have been so sick and those that have lost loved ones during this really odd time in our history. We've never experienced anything like this before, yet we know that you're still in charge. We ask that you be with those that have lost loved ones, be with those that need your comfort and care, be with those that have lost jobs and are worried about their future, those that are hungry, those that are oppressed. We ask that you just be with each one of them and hopefully help us to find our way to them, to where we can be your hands and your feet and minister to them on your behalf. We ask all these things this morning in your son's name. I mean, the, the lesson for us is, um, on page 145 in your lesson book, if you would like to follow along, uh, the main idea about the unforgiven is that, uh, according to the lesson, is that Satan will try to kill your joy, steal your peace, and destroy your testimony, but his power is broken. The questions that we're going to explore is, will I face criticism by serving God? And that's going to be an interesting question. A lot of times we don't think that we face too much criticism uh, in our day and time about going to church and whatnot, but yet there are people still in the world that they have to go through dangerous toils just to have a meeting and a group together or to pray together uh, because they live in a country that doesn't allow what our country allows us to do. They give us a chance to go where we want to go and to pray as we feel fit to pray. The study aim of this lesson is to understand that the only sin God will not forgive is terminal unbelief. And we're going to explore that too, terminal unbelief. Um, and the quick read is for us is the religious leaders accuse Jesus of being in union with Satan. And that's always an interesting question to me, but this, Jesus responded to them with a stern warning about their spiritual blindness. So we're going to talk this morning about how Jesus worked in this particular part of time. Uh, this lesson is um, set in the town of Capernaum, and this was described as home to Jesus. Now, we know that he, didn't, he wasn't born there, but that this is likely to be where the family moved uh, when the time came. But the author of our lesson goes off on a little different tangent here at the very beginning that for those of us that are my age, near my age, or something like that, we remember Saturday morning cartoons and the Lone Ranger. And they always talked about, they talked about the Lone Ranger in the first part of the lesson on page 146. And, and if you remember ever seeing the Lone Ranger, there was always people in the first part of the story about, is this masked man a good man or is he a bad man? 
why is he wearing a mask? That always comes up in this lesson. You can't tell by the way he looked whether he was good or bad. But we know that throughout the, the plot was very similar, that the Lone Ranger would come into town and he would see a wrong that needed to be righted. And he would fix that situation. And always at the end, and I'll ask the question, but then I have to answer it because I can't hear you answering it. But it, they always ask a specific question right at the end of the story as the Lone Ranger was riding off into the sunset. Do you remember what that was that they always ask? And the answer was, who is this masked man? Who was that masked man? And a lot of times, as the author is saying, the people around Jesus was trying to figure out who is this man? Who is this person that can talk to demons? Who is this person that can heal the sick? Who is this person that says he has powers that no one has ever seen before? And the people of Jesus's day were trying to figure out who he was. Um, Jesus had the same type of a problem that the Lone Ranger had. Now, that sounds kind of funny, but uh, they didn't know whether Jesus was for good or whether he was for bad. And even though it looked like on the first blush that he was always doing good, um, many of the people felt like Jesus had other characteristics because they didn't understand who he was. Some looked at him and came to the wrong conclusion. So why, why would you look at Jesus who was healing people, taking care of people, um, feeding people, blessing people? Why would you look at him as something bad? Well, if you were one of the Jewish people and the religious leaders of the day, he was breaking a lot of the Jewish laws that you live by every day. And they thought this man, although he's doing good, is doing it for all the wrong reasons. He's not a good Jew. He's not following what we think we're supposed to be. So what did they call Jesus? Do you remember the different things that they called Jesus? He was called rabbi. He was called teacher. He was called a blasphemer. He was called a lawbreaker. Um, he was called a lot of names by the Jews because he was not representing the model Jewish person that they wanted him to be. Um, they were blinded by his goodness. And sometimes when you're blinded by goodness, you tend to think the other way. And they were th calling him demonic, uh, that he had those type of tendencies. They failed to understand that Jesus came to bring abundant life and to provide the way for all of us to enter a right relationship with God. Now think about that for just a minute, the right relationship with God. Jesus was coming and he was ministering to everyone that he came in contact with. And Jesus was the one that was letting everybody know that God would love them and that God would bless them and that God would welcome them no matter what sins they had committed. Yet the title of the lesson is called The Unforgiving, and we will explore that a little bit more. Jesus wanted to bring everybody into a right relationship with God. Think for a second what Satan's point of view would have been. What was Satan trying to do? He was trying to do everything that Jesus wasn't doing. He was trying to do exactly opposite that. Satan wanted the opposite of what Jesus wanted. He wanted to rob everyone of their peace. He wanted to steal their joy. And he wanted to keep us away from God. So with that, I'm going to read the scriptures. It's on page 146 in your quarterly, and I'm just going to read them right out of the quarterly. And bear with me. It's Mark, the third chapter, the 20th through the 30th verse. Then Jesus entered a house. And again, uh, again, a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Beelzebub, But by the prince of the demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and he began to speak to them in parables. 
and we're going to talk about parables in a minute. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then they can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all of their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, for they are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, he has an impure spirit. And we're going to talk about all of that in different sections here in the next little bit. We're going to pick this apart just a little bit. As I said before, Jesus was described as being home in Capernaum. And the question to me to say, always is, doesn't it feel great to be at home? But I can ask that question now in early 2021, when for most of 2020, we've all been at home for way too long. And some of us want to get out of the house and we're still afraid to. So normally when I would say, isn't it great to be home? I mean, our, our favorite place to be is home, but sometimes we like to travel. Sometimes we like to do this. We like to do that, but it's always nice to come back home. Jesus was reportedly back at home. Mark said that he was at home. And aren't we lucky to feel at home? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. The pandemic has somewhat changed that. Jesus was at home, but there was such a large crowd that he could not even enjoy a meal. We know that wherever Jesus went, two groups of people came to see him most of the time. People that wanted to be healed, people that were curious, people that wanted to be touched and loved and everything else. And then there was the other people that wanted to catch him doing something wrong in their in their in their feelings. Uh, and then it says in Mark, it says, those that were nearest and dear to him seized him, believing that he had taken leave of his senses. Who would have been the nearest and dearest to Jesus? Now think about that for a minute. Who would have been the closest people to Jesus? Many people would say the disciples, but the disciples were not the ones that Mark was talking about. Who else would have been nearest and dearest to Jesus if he was at home? There's a good chance that Margaret was Mark was referring to the half brothers and sisters of Jesus, his own family. It says they took charge of him and they thought that maybe he was had taken leave of his senses. Why would your brothers and sisters think that you'd taken leave of your senses? What about this situation made Jesus scary to them like that? Or, or why were they worried so much about him? Um, think about this. If you were at home and your spouse was getting ready to come home, if if I was planning to come home for supper and my wife was making dinner and I showed up and there was 11 cars full of people behind me that I hadn't mentioned that were coming home with me, um, how do you think my spouse would feel about that situation? And where would I sleep that night? Uh, this may have been what was going on. Why do you think that the brothers and sisters would have questioned themselves about Jesus? What, what could have been going through their minds? What questions were they asking? And think about that for just a minute. Um, the brothers and sisters would have probably loved him dearly, but they would have asked questions like, why did he leave the security of his home? Why did Jesus invite the wrath of the Jewish people by teaching and preaching the way that he was? Why was he always standing up for one side when the other side was the side that they were worried about maybe beating him down? Why did Jesus become an itinerant teacher and rabbi instead of just a carpenter? Couldn't he have just stayed at home and become a carpenter? 
And then they might've been asking questions like some of the other people watching him and said, why are you associating with these people? Now imagine brothers and sisters coming to you and saying, you know, whose side are you on? Have you ever heard somebody say that to you? Whose side are you on? And sometimes that would hurt your feelings by saying, you know, I'm on my family's side. I'm on, I'm on your side. But sometimes that puts you in conflict with the individual that you're on the side of. Jesus might have been experiencing some sibling rivalry. Imagine Jesus showing up at home and then bringing all these outsiders into the house that was so crowded they couldn't even eat a meal. Imagine how the siblings would feel. Maybe they, maybe they had good intentions. Maybe they wanted to protect Jesus. And maybe by protecting Jesus, they were going to be protecting themselves. Do you think that they might have been wor worried about being guilty by association? I'm the brother or half-brother of Jesus Christ. And if he's causing trouble, that's going to make people look at me differently. No one wanted anybody in their family to cause undo criticism uh, about the family and where you were coming from and what your actions were. And maybe the brothers and sisters were all trying to feel this. We don't know exactly, but they were asking questions and they believed that he had taken leave of his senses. Why in the world, Jesus, would you bring all these people into our house? Why would you let these people come in here and accuse you of things and 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 do all this stuff at at the house can't you just be just a a regular brother here when 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 you're with us um when i said earlier whose side are you on i mean could you be talking about a spouse versus a spouse a family member versus a family member a boss versus an employee a team member versus another team member uh who are you loyal to and I think all the brothers and sisters were probably having all these questions. The religious leaders of Jesus' day questioned whether Jesus acted in obedience to God or was this the force of darkness? Now, all through the Bible, there is the thought of the good and the bad. And when it talks about the forces of evil and the forces of darkness, I mean, we're inundated that with that even today. If any of you have ever seen any of the Star Wars movies, who's the, who's the force of evil and who's the good guys? Uh, when Luke Skywalker fought with Darth Vader, who was wearing white and who was wearing black? Who was the good guy? Who was the bad guy? Um, they accused, some of them accused Jesus of being uh, possessed by Be Beelzebub. Now, Beelzebub has been described as a lot of things, and the scriptures around the lesson um, sort of explain that. It's a little different from what I was thinking myself, but according to the lesson, one of the teachers of the law accused Jesus of being possessed by Beelzebub, so who was he? The biblical scholars have different opinions about Beelzebub. They call him Lord of the Flies. Now, Lord of the Flies is kind of a weird name but it also means the lord of filth so this is anything that is dirty nasty unruly unkept they also called him lord of the dwelling and that's that's kind of a funny one is why would you use lord of the dwelling as a um negative uh Somebody, somebody, uh, or someone in the scriptures referred to it as the master of the household. Well, the master of the household could be the head of the household that was leading everybody in the right way, but you also could be the master of the household that was leading everybody down the wrong path or setting a bad examples. They saw him as the prince of demons. And it's always interesting to me how people could see the best person living the best life that had ever lived and associated him with demons. We know people came from all over the reasons to see Jesus. Why do you think they came to see Jesus? What's, what's the point? Well, I mean, they came from every region. The, the lesson we had last week, it was talked about that they came from the northern provinces. They came from across the river of Jordan in another country. They came from all over the southern kingdom. They came all over 
just to see Jesus. Why would they want to do that? Well, one of the reasons might be that Jesus might have been just the best show in town. He was the most popular thing that was going on. And whether you liked him or you didn't like him, you wanted to be there to see what was going to happen next. Uh, for many people, they came to Jesus and pressed in on him to where he could heal them. They felt like because of his amazing powers that just the touch of Jesus would heal you. Well, even if you were perfectly healthy, wouldn't it be worth your time and effort to go and to touch Jesus if something inside of you that wasn't noticeable could be repaired? So there could have been that. There could have been curiosity. There could have been, they were just curious to see who this, this guy was. They wanted to catch him doing something wrong. Now, who would that have been? That would have been the Pharisees. That would have been the Judaizers. That would have been the Jewish people. They just kept seeing Jesus doing things that was wrong. Now, he wasn't doing things wrong according to scriptures, but he was doing things wrong according to the Mishnah, which was the 600 plus Jewish laws that built this little fence around the scriptures that was trying to keep the Jewish people safe from breaking any of the really big laws. So they gave you a whole bunch of little laws to keep you away from breaking the big laws. Jesus was accused as when he cast out demons, he was accused of being in league with Satan and not with God. Now, let's give them a little credit. Why do you think that Jesus was accused of being with Satan when he could cast out demons, when he could talk to demons? And maybe that's the answer. Maybe they felt like since he could talk to demons, he was a demon himself. Uh, couldn't have been further from the truth if you read the scriptures and what we know. But the people of the day had limited knowledge of good and evil. But Jesus pointed out that neither a divided kingdom or a divided household could stand. Now, maybe if you heard me read that in scriptures. You also heard that in some other political speech by Abraham Lincoln. And most people weren't aware or didn't realize that Abraham Lincoln was quoting scripture when he said a house divided against itself cannot stand when he was talking about the North and the South during the war between the states. He pointed out that Satan, he, he gave a, he, he, Jesus was frustrated again with those that, that, that said these things. And he called them over and he said, how can I be in league with Satan when I am casting out demons. And he's saying that, you know, Satan would not cast out demons that were acting on his own behalf. He said, no, so I can't be, I can't be Satan. Aren't you happy that we cured little Johnny over here and he's no longer possessed according to your way of thinking. And all they could see was that he was talking to demons. Jesus used a parable to talk to them, and parables were used to make a specific point. There were, there were other things that were used in, in biblical relationships and biblical speeches, but a parable was used to make a point. And he said in the scripture, suppose a thief wanted to rob the home of a powerful person. He says, you can't rob the home of a powerful person unless you subdue that person first. You have to tie him up. You have to make him to where he is no longer an issue. Then you can take anything that you want from his home. And he's using that as a parable to make a point. He's saying Satan's powerful. And we know that Satan's powerful because he has all these people that have lost their way and they're making him powerful but we know because of the end of revelations that satan is on borrowed time now many of us would say 2000 years ago when satan was near where jesus was and he's still around borrowed time sounds like pretty long time but we do know that at the end satan will not survive and that he'll be thrown into the lake of fire but Satan was, a, was strong. 
but Jesus was going to overpower him. Jesus said Satan was strong. Why would he say Satan was strong? He said that Jesus possessed the lives of those who were suffering demonic torment. So he had a lot of people in his wake, but Jesus's power was greater. The attitude toward, toward Satan in that time and today gravitate towards one extreme or another. Some people underestimate the power of evil. Evil is a strong, strong force. Others are fixated on the satanic side and attribute to the devil more than he can possess. There are folks that worship the devil and they say that he's more powerful and can do things that he cannot do. But the Bible points to a middle ground. The Bible points to the fact that Satan is strong, but he is living on borrowed time. Evil is real. Temptation is powerful. Um, the devil wants to destroy our credibility when we seek to bear witness to Christ. If you would see a Christian go out and lose his temper and act poorly in a situation, and then he came over to try to minister to you and share Christ, would he serve as a good example or a bad example? Um, it's always a, a, a fear of good Christians that they don't always show their best side. And it's something to think about when we tend to lose our way or lose our temper. But the Bible presents Satan as a defeated enemy living on borrowed time and remember the ring of fire where he'll be thrown in Revelations. So why is it so easy today to believe that the devil exists? Some people cre create all these different movies, genres, and everything else, and it's real easy to present the evil side. We see these at Halloween. We see these movies. We see these things that are interesting. Uh, we see these hauntings. We watch ghost TV shows. And we see that there's things that are going on that we don't understand. And sometimes it's easier for people to believe what they can see as evil when they can't see something as good. A while ago when I said, isn't it nice to feel at home? Well, how would you like it if your home life was the most tormented place that you had? If you were in a home where there was no love, where there was no food, where there was only drugs or relationship problems or anger or hurt, um, this, this would make home a terrible thing. But Christ is going to be the victor. We should be vigilant and stand strong to resist temptation. But we have no reason, we have no reason to fear satanic power. What? Now, now think about that. Why, why is it okay not to fear Satan? I mean, aren't you scared of what you see on TV? I mean, what what terribly bad could happen to you? Um Satan wants to come and rob us and take us away from everything that Jesus stands for. He wants us to pull us into his company and not be in the company of Christians and Jesus. And then here they're talking about the unpardonable sin. We think as Christians that every sin can be pardoned. And Jesus tells us here in two different sets of phrases that there is one thing that cannot be forgiven. And that scares the daylights out of people. Sometimes it scares me. Jesus emphasized the assurance that God would forget all, forgive all kinds of sins. And this is all provided throughout all the gospels. Jesus was criticizing for accepting and extending fellowship to all kinds of sinners the prostitutes, the tax collectors. Look at Jesus's group of people that he's hanging around with. Even his brothers and sisters probably said, why in the world are you hanging around with these fishermen, these tax collectors, and these people of dubious 
lifestyles. Jesus presented God's mercy and, and forgiveness. And he told us that God would forgive all sins. Jesus does not speak of an offense that will not be forgiven. Uh, Jesus does speak of an offense that will not be forgiven. Blaspheme spoken against the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit. Now, this is, this is where there's some interesting concepts here. The Holy Spirit at this time in Mark hasn't come. The Holy Spirit that we know as Christians in modern day times, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, equal with God, equal with the Son, equal with the Father. And we understand that from this time. But Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit before that. There were people that said, and the Spirit moved upon them, and it made them whole, or it made them crazy, mean, and satanic. And depending on how you use the words of the Spirit, the Spirit was being blasphemed against. After Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, when we believe that the Holy Spirit is a person within the Trinity, the Holy Spirit makes sinners acutely aware of their sin, and he draws, the Holy Spirit draws them to the Savior. That's the Holy Spirit's job. That's, the Holy Spirit's supposed to be in us right now. It's that little voice that says, mm, you know, this is, this is the way you ought to go. It's going to draw us to the Savior. But they, they said the Spirit came upon him, and it made him whole. Or they'd say the Spirit. Spirit came upon, came upon him, and it made him crazy or convulsive or whatever. They used the Spirit a lot. Uh, that sin at Jesus' time was what was considered unpardonable. That has changed. That was perfect for that time. It's a little different now, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But the Hebrew Scripture said that the Spirit came upon the prophets. The Spirit would move the hearts of the people. The religious leaders of the day failed to acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God, and they actually put him in league of, with Satan. And our lesson talks about a man in the 1500s named Balthazar Hubmailer, Mayer, H-U-B-M-A-I-E-R. And I would invite you to read the little box paragraphs about him on page 153. This is why Jesus described that the, the offense was unforgivable in Balthazar's situation. He was an ardent supporter of Christianity, but he was tortured the first time when he was into captivity to the point that he renounced all of that. Uh, he was near death and he just was barely hanging on and he just said, I'm wrong, I renounce it. And as soon as he recovered, he asked for forgiveness about that. He saw the depth of his sin and he was immediately imprisoned again and later burned and uh, died that way. But he was an ardent, ardent supporter of Jesus and Christianity to the very end of his life in the 1500s. The religious leaders, um, Jesus said that this was the reason why the offense was unforgivable. Before we can be reconciled with God, we must recognize our own sinful condition and want to turn from that sin. The Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, and everything else, what were they blind to? My answer to that would be they, were, they thought that they were so perfect because they followed all these man-made laws rather than the law of just taking care of each other that, that God wanted us to have. You know, um, take care of your, your neighbor, your brothers, your sisters. Take care of those that are around you. And they got so far away from that that they couldn't see that. They weren't reconciled to God. They were reconciling themselves as perfect based on the laws that we've man-made and they were so perfect that they could not see how wrong they were. They're looking at Jesus, the most special person that ever walked the earth, 
taking care of people, healing them, casting out demons, and they associated him with demons because he didn't fit their model of who they thought God was. Jesus says, y'all be careful. We cannot repent. They could not repent because they couldn't see their need for repentance. If you think you're perfect, you don't have anything to apologize for. God says we have to recognize our own sinful condition and want to turn from that sin. And if that is the case, he will forgive the sins that we have forget that we have have done. The religious of the late religious leaders of the day couldn't recognize their own sin. They were so messed up, they looked at pure goodness of Jesus and they saw pure evil because he didn't fit what they wanted to see. And he didn't include them because they were non-believers. So what does that mean for us today? What does it mean for us right now in 2021? What are we supposed to do with a lesson like this? The religious leaders were not guilty of an unforgivable sin simply because they failed to recognize Jesus as the design, divine son of God during his ministries but because they didn't fully understand, they couldn't understand. Remember the disciples of Jesus. We, we, we can't be too critical. Even the disciples of Jesus didn't fully know who he was until after the resurrection. You know that the disciples, I mean, Peter, Peter denied him. The religious leaders, they weren't guilty of an unforgivable sin just because they didn't recognize Jesus for who he was because even the disciples didn't know fully who he was. The religious leaders were condemned because of their willful and persistent unwillingness to allow the Spirit of God to guide them to the truth about Jesus. They were not willing to ever say that they were wrong. They were not willing to ever say that they had sinned. And it said, no one should fear that he or she is at some point in the past committed a sin against God that cannot be forgiven. If they know that they've sinned, and this is important, if they know that they've sinned and they recognize how bad it was, it, that means there is still hope for reconciliation. And all too often, we try to put our sins behind us and forgive, forget them and not bring them to the forefront, talk about them and ask for forgiveness. And all of us, to some extent, are guilty of that to some degree. But those who recognize their sinfulness, who repent of their sins, and who some humbly seek God's forgiveness in Christ will receive it. And the thing that I want to leave you with is this that I thought was interesting at the very last of this lesson. It says the only people beyond the reach of God's grace are those that place themselves there. Now think about that. If we place ourselves so far out of God's reach, what then? If we recognize that we are sinful, if we see that we need to do something about that, there is hope for us. And we need to help ourselves and each other ask for forgiveness. Because according to Jesus, and according to what we're reading in Mark, that is the only way that we will let, we will get our sins forgiven. Let's close now with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again, we come before you and, and we ask for your love. We know that we have spent a lot of time during our lives pushing ourselves so far away from you because we either didn't have time, we didn't want to be bothered, we didn't want to say that we were not in control, but for whatever reason, we've pushed you away. Help us to realize that. Help us to think of our sins and to ask you for forgiveness because we realize that that is the only way that we can truly and completely be forgiven. We ask all these things this morning in your son's name. Amen.
I hope you guys have a good day. I'm happy to have had a chance to talk to you again during this lesson. And I just hope that God will uh, grant you peace. Thank you very much. Goodbye. There.